Hello and welcome to this lecture on Fairness and Justice, Part 2. In this lecture, we'll continue our discussion of the principle requiring us to treat people fairly and justly, and primarily what we're going to do is look at the ethical bases for differential treatment. So recall that treating people fairly as a general principle guides our action in two ways, by requiring that we not discriminate between individuals on irrelevant grounds, and by requiring that we give appropriate attention to individuals' needs, interests, ability, etc. This principle arises for professionals and public servants as a requirement to seek the just and fair compensation for individuals who have been disadvantaged, either individually or systematically as a group, and to seek the just and fair consideration of what individuals deserve and what their needs, interests, and entitlements, etc. are. So let's examine first treating people according to what they deserve, or desert. No, I don't mean ice cream, but uh, desert in the sense of what people deserve or what people have earned. Treating people according to what they deserve justifies a differential distribution of the benefits and burdens of social life because this distribution has been earned by the individual, either as reward or as punishment. These terms reward and punishment are often used in the context of deservingness. Earning a differential treatment results from some positive action undertaken by the individual. That is, the individual has done or prepared or undertaken something. They've made a contribution or they've attempted to make a contribution. Uh, they have demonstrated responsible behavior in accepting the consequences of their actions and so forth. So earning differential treatment results from some undertaking and this is in a sense a backward-looking way of identifying some feature or quality of an individual that warrants differential treatment. It is backward-looking in the sense that it examines what the individual has already done, what has taken place um, prior to encountering them as a professional or as a public servant. Not just any worthy contributions, efforts, or behaviors are relevant, however. Those which justify differential treatment must be direct, directly related to the objectives of the profession or the public service role, or also must be directly related to the ends or the activity or the undertaking at issue. So how do we take account for a person's contribution? Since deservingness um, in part asks us to assess their contributions, how do we do this? Treating people differentially on the basis of their contributions means that those who contribute to achieving the objectives of the role or to the success of the project or the undertaking warrant or deserve more or better treatment than those who undertake no such contribution. So, for example, a student who works hard to learn the course material is generally perceived as deserving of more attention and more detailed comments and feedback on their assignments, more encouragement, more support by the instructor than a student who rarely attends class and submits their work late, and usually when it is submitted it's pretty sloppy. Another example in the context of health care, a patient who undertakes to improve her health and to recuperate from whatever her illness is, is seen as more deserving of attention, more deserving of support and encouragement by the medical staff and the nurse than the patient who has ignored medical advice and continues with their unhealthy behavior and their unhealthy conduct, and thereby slowing their recuperation and not improving their health. For example, a property owner who undertakes to clear brush to a defensible space around her property is seen as less deserving of a citation where citations are issued um, by the county or by the fire service if the property catches fire than a person who neglects to establish defensible space or does so sloppily or acts recklessly with flammables in dry areas. And finally, another example uh, in the area of policing, a drunk and disorderly individual who resists police directions is uh, properly seen as more deserving of arrest than her friend who is also drunk but less disorderly and cooperates fully with the police. 
So these are ways in which we can differentially account for persons' contributions and thereby um, differentially uh, award benefits or burdens. However, there are some challenges with using contributions as a way to establish what someone deserves. Oftentimes it's the case that the circumstances are sufficiently complex that assessing the contributions an individual makes can be difficult. So what is the contribution that is being measured? We can measure contributions in a couple of ways. Making more of a certain contribution can be seen as better, especially if that can be understood as remedial. But also, undertaking to avoid having to make these contributions can also be seen as better when that can be understood in the context of preventing some other course of action. So, consider two patients um, trying to improve their cardiovascular health. One, uh, by undertaking a weight loss regime, reducing their weight to a healthier weight, and the other um, undertaking a fitness regime from the start already at a good weight, already at a heart healthy weight, and undertaking a fitness regime to avoid having to, in the future, undertake a weight loss um, program or undertake um, other uh, more drastic measures to improve their cardiovascular fitness. So these two undertakings, these two efforts, these two contributions to improved cardiovascular health are different in that one is remedial, one is removing weight when um, when the patient is already uh, in excess in a heart unhealthy weight category and the other is uh, already at a healthy weight and undertaking to maintain that good health. We can also ask what is the quality that is being measured? So for example we could have um, we could measure contributions by the frequency of the tasks completed, so working faster without necessarily being as attentive to the quality of the work produced, or we can focus on the quality of the task completed, which might require us to work more slowly, that is less quickly, but focusing on the quality of the work. And here you, an example might be um, for student learning. So one student might complete all of the quizzes in record time and consider themselves to have uh, learned the material but they've done so with considerable error on the questions compared to another student who completes fewer quizzes and so it might seem that she hasn't learned as much of the material but in completing fewer questions being much more attentive to the quality of the the quiz that she's done um, she scores higher on each of the quizzes, though there are fewer of them. How do we measure the student's contribution to their learning? These are two different ways that we can do it. And we can also be attentive, or we should also be attentive, to where objectives might conflict or where courses of action might conflict. So when role objectives require conflicting courses of action, then from one perspective, undertaking that action can be seen as a contribution to the end or the goal that's being pursued or to the objective of the role, but from the other perspective that action can be seen as undermining the the goal to be pursued or the or the objective of the role. For example, a patient who takes chemotherapy. The chemotherapy uh, treatment will be seen as contributing to their health by uh, destroying the cancer, but from another perspective the chemotherapy treatment can be seen as detrimental to the health of the patient because of the extreme nausea that results leading to rapid health depleting weight loss if not um, attended to. Another challenge of course is comparing contributions. So if differential contributions justify differential treatment then we have to have some basis for comparing contributions especially when these contributions are very different and it may be the case that different contributions just can't be compared and another way of talking about that is that these contributions are incommensurable they cannot be compared with one another um, to any degree of accuracy or for any relevant um, decision making for example a drug offender who broke off with all their drug using friends and dealers and is on a wait list for rehab undertaking to um, improve their life improve their health compared with a child sex offender who always wears their ankle bracelet, always reports as needed, and uh, but whose work takes him past playgrounds. So both of these individuals are contributing to improving their lives, to, uh, 
to complying with requirements to undertaking successful courses of action, but they're very different. How do we measure these different contributions these individuals make? Who is deserving of better um, or worse treatment or better or worse distributions of benefits and burdens? Well, another way we might try to figure out who deserves what is by accounting for effort. So if we have difficulty looking at contributions as a basis for determining desert, then we can look at effort. And so we see that effort can ju justify differential treatment when actual contributions are not commensurable, when we have these difficulties with assessing uh, and comparing contributions. Effort allows for more individualized attention to an individual's conduct toward achieving the objectives of the role or toward success in the activity. So when we focus our attention on effort, we can then accommodate uh, expectations for individual success given their training, their education, their knowledge, as well as their preparation for the task or the role or the undertaking, and as well as uh, taking account of the available resources which would facilitate um, success if they were available. So we can uh, by focusing our attention on effort, get a much more detailed and individualized picture of a person's deservingness. But of course, effort runs into challenges as well. Effort may mask a failure to prepare or poor training or a reluctance on the part of the individual to use the resources that are available to him or her. For example, an accountant who has to put in additional weeks of overtime to finish her part of a project of an audit, say, of a company, but she has to put in that additional overtime because she neglected to complete the training on the new software which the project is using. So had she completed the training previously, prior to beginning the project, then she wouldn't now have to put in so much overtime. So if we just looked at what she's doing on the project, it looks like she's putting in an exorbitant amount of effort into the success of this audit, but if we look more closely we see that that excessive effort, that almost heroic effort, looks worthy of a positive distribution of benefits and burdens, but when we look more closely we see that actually that effort is trying is her attempt to compensate for a prior failure or ill preparation. Also another challenge with regard to effort is that effort may not measure an individual's actual ability or willingness so much as their natural ability or talent or their lack thereof. For example, compare two excellent nurses, two excellent deserving nurses, a nurse for whom even the most challenging parts of his job are easy because he's naturally caring and responsive to the needs of others and so it seems to the observer that his job is effortless. It doesn't require much effort on his part. It almost looks like he doesn't prepare or, or do much of anything. He just shows up and is excellent. Compare that with a nurse for whom personal interaction is difficult and challenging and for whom caring does not come naturally. So for her, she has to exert a greater effort and a greater preparation while on the job. And so looking at these two individuals just by uh, in terms of their effort, we might think that the second of the nurses is much more deserving because she's putting in a greater effort than the first. However, that um, apparent difference in effort really is um, a difference in natural ability or talent, not necessarily anything that that should warrant um, a differential distribution of benefits and burdens, or at least we'd want to be careful about that. Okay, so let's take a look at another way we can try to figure out desert or deservingness by accounting for an individual's behavior, that is by their motivation. So motivation can justify differential treatment when what we're doing is uh, looking at whether the individual is taking responsibility for their role, for their success, and recognizing um, that he or she has a duty to act and acts accordingly. So motivation, um, wanting, willingness, undertaking the role. We can see the difference between people who are motivated to take responsibility and who thereby ensure that their actions directly achieve the objectives of the role or the success of the undertaking or the project. And we also can see and notice that some people who lack motivation tend to seem negligent, careless, and are often unwilling to act 
toward the roles, objectives, or to the success of the activity until they absolutely have to do so. So accounting for motivation and behavior allows a greater benefit to the motivated. So we can say, look, you're really motivated. You didn't take much pushing. I didn't have to use any um, inducements or incentives. You wanted to undertake this role and responsibility, and you've prepared, and you've done a great job. And so that is the person that gets the promotion compared with the person whom I had to cajole, I had to remind, I had to send notices to, I had to um, prompt and, and induce and otherwise um, urge to undertake the same job. That's not the person who I would want to promote. So how can I account for this? Um, well, I'm accounting for this differential distribution of benefits, a promotion, in terms of individual behavior and motivation. For example, a teacher who passes a student who only begins the essay the night before the due date versus failing the student who has been preparing steadily for the past two weeks. That sounds contrary, doesn't it? We would want and expect to see the opposite. If the teacher is ethical, then on the basis of behavior and motivation, it would be uh, the, the student who's prepared steadily for the past two weeks who gets the good grade, who gets the passing score, not the student who undertook the essay the night before uh, the due date and perhaps missed the due date or even met the due date. And this is regardless of the quality of the paper. So our expectations, our ethical expectations of an instructor is that they account for motivation and behavior of the individuals and distribute the grades, in the case of teaching, accordingly. Another example, consider reprimanding the patient who lies in bed all day waiting for the nurse to make him eat, compared with praising the patient who gets up to exercise, eats at mealtime, and informs himself of his health options. Now there, our expectation corresponds with what the nurse would have done. So, accounting for behavior, a nurse would properly reprimand the patient who lies in bed, who needs cajoling, who um, doesn't want to eat unless someone actually makes him do it, and praising the patient who undertakes their own um, efforts, who's motivated to ensure that their health is achieved. Another example, firing a county clerk who neglects to read the new procedures manual when processing liquor licensing applications leading to delays, perhaps businesses get closed, versus promoting the clerk who processes the liquor licenses accurately and quickly because she studied the manual and she's informed herself of the new procedures. So there, taking account of behavior and motivation, that would um, correspond with our expectations. So the supervisor who fired the clerk would be right to have done so and promotes the clerk um, who is prepared and studied the manual, um, the supervisor would be right to have done so. But of course there are challenges, as with everything, there are challenges in using behavior and motivation as a basis for distributing the uh, benefits and burdens available. First, it is notoriously difficult to assess motivation when all we have to go by is observed conduct. It might not be the case that someone's failing or someone's um, not achieving our expectations is um, due not to their not being motivated, they're not being responsible for their actions, but it may be the result of some factors beyond the individual's control. So it's difficult to distinguish whether the poor quality of their of their undertaking is a result of negligence or carelessness or the result of factors beyond their control. They can look very similar. And also, thirdly, using motivation and behavior to differentiate treatment assumes that individuals have more control than they may actually have over the circumstances of their conduct. The student who only begins the essay the night before the due date may only have that much time available. Perhaps they have small children who require attention, perhaps they're working full time, perhaps they have a companion or a parent who's sick. So there may be factors beyond the individual's control which affect their ability to act 
in the way that we might expect if what we're looking for, if we're, what we're trying to discern is the individual's motivation. Accounting for entitlement. All right, well, we can say sometimes that it's the case that a person deserves a certain form of treatment because they have an entitlement to that treatment. To have an entitlement is to have a claim which is owed and with regard to which some specific other has a duty to comply. Now the nature of the entitlement and whose responsibility is to comply depends upon several things. It depends upon the basis for the entitlement. It depends upon the relationship the entitlement establishes between the individuals. And it also depends upon the ability of others to comply with it or not. So, for example, paying the retainer fee to an attorney entitles an individual to that attorney's services. Similarly, by accepting the retainer, the attorney accepts the obligation to serve the client. So, there's a relationship that's been established, an entitlement that's created, and a duty that's created. And we can identify um, who has the duty the duty belongs to the attorney who accepted the retainer fee, the entitlement belongs to the individual who paid the retainer fee, and uh, the relationship that is established is a relationship of attorney-client privilege. Another example would be for ex f um, paying county sewage fees entitles a property owner to sue a repair from the county if there's a, a, a major storm that damages the sewer system. The county then has a duty to repair the line. And again, a relationship is established. In this sense, the offering of a service, the county offers sewer services to property owners in exchange for a fee. The property owner is paying the fee. Damage results. And the county has the responsibility to repair the damage. So we can see the basis for the entitlement, the relationship that's established, and the ability to comply with it or not. Another example might be the city firefighter who's ready and willing to work on the job uh, every day scheduled, and as such is entitled to payment of, of uh, her salary from the city. The city, by hiring firefighters and offering the service to the community is responsible for the payment of salaries. So here again you see a different context in which the basis for the entitlement is the, the um, availability to work on the terms provided. The city's providing a service. That service requires firefighters and so the firefighter who is ready and able for duty uh, then deserves their salary to be paid. So the city is obligated to pay the salaries. So in this way, entitlements um, work to connect people with one another. And the nice thing about entitlements is it's, it becomes very clear what um, sort of treatment is available. So a firefighter who is not working for the city, but perhaps is unemployed, would have no um, entitlement to a salary from the city. The individual who hasn't paid a retainer fee to an attorney uh, doesn't have the entitlement to attorney-client privilege um, when he or she talks to the attorney. Fairness requires, remember, fairness requires that individuals with the same entitlement are owed the same treatment. So recall from the previous lecture, fairness requires individuals who are morally relevantly similar to receive morally relevantly similar treatment. So individuals with the same entitlement are owed the same treatment. So an attorney who has multiple clients, all of whom have paid a retainer fee, they all have the same entitlement, and she has the same duty with regard to um, her actions toward them. Individuals with a different entitlement are owed differential treatment accordingly. So the property owner who has opted out of um, paying fees to the county for sewage and instead uses a septic system then when the storm damages the septic system has no entitlement that the county repair that septic system. So differential entitlements um, justify differential treatment. 
Now, the nice thing also about entitlements and using entitlements to determine whether or not um, someone deserves a distribution of benefits and burdens or some other distribution of benefits and burdens is that the existence of entitlements is generally a factual matter. There's generally evidence that indicates that this individual is entitled to such and so treatment. So there's a fact of the matter and we can establish the fact of the matter simply by asking does this person have an entitlement in this case? Has this individual paid the retainer fee to this attorney? There's a fact of the matter. Has this individual um, been hired by the city to provide firefighting services? There's a fact of the matter. Has this individual paid their sewage fees to the county? There's a fact to the matter. And so it's, it's generally perceived to be nice and clear and tidy. Typically, entitlements are established through policies that are adopted, whether those policies are in the workplace or in the county or in the city or in the institution, regulations that may pertain to the undertaking or to the profession or to the public service, the existence of contracts, ethics codes may establish entitlements on the part of some, particularly clients, law might create entitlements, and um, less certainly, less definitively, uh, individuals may have entitlements through practices. So if this has been the way that we've done things around here for so long, then that might actually um, generate an entitlement on the part of the individual to continuing those practices as expected. Accounting for need. Now in the previous lecture we've already talked about need considerably, so let's just take a little more detailed look. Remember that needs can justify differential treatment but not all needs are equal. We have to make a distinction between um, the kinds of needs that are baseline essential needs. Baseline essential needs are needs that should be uniformly satisfied for everyone. A differential satisfaction of essential needs can only be justified by the existence of differential essential needs. So some people require a higher caloric intake, some people require a lesser, some people have um, needs for shelter and accommodation that satisfy their basic needs uh, in ways that others don't. People who are uh, who have uh, an illness that requires them to be on an oxygen tank have a requirement, a baseline essential need for accommodations that ensure um, the availability of oxygen. So that might be um, either through a hospital or hospice care facility or some other institutional setting or privately, um, that that be provided to the individual as a means of ensuring that their basic needs are satisfied. It's also important to notice that needs can vary according to the goals or the expectations for success, or by established customs, or by experience and capability, or even by temperament. We also have to be attentive to any deviations from the satisfaction of baseline or normalized needs uh, that those have to be justified and deviations from the satisfaction of those needs would then be proportional to the, different, uh, the difference in the needs that are established. Not all needs are relevant. Some needs pertain directly to the benefit uh, or the burden that's at issue. Some needs uh, pertain only indirectly. Also, it's important to distinguish a need which results from choices an individual has made and distinguish those from needs that might be imposed by circumstance or by others. So, for example, had the individual chosen differently, then she would have different needs. These needs that are the result of her choices are dependent upon those choices and are contingent. They're not necessary. Compare that with someone who has a need for a certain amount of resources or a certain allocation of time um, because they're, uh, they've been given a task or they've been given a goal established by others and so their need for those resources are directly related to um, the task that's been assigned. So those needs are not contingent on any of their choices, those needs are contingent on the circumstances. Challenges that have to do with trying to account for desert in, the, in terms of need is that 
uh, it can become very tricky, very difficult to distinguish needs from wants, desires, and preferences. So a need is something that an individual in a significant way can't control the existence of. Uh, whereas wants and desires and preferences are presumably under the individual's control. I can curb my desire for Twinkies. I can uh, curb my preference for um, early morning work and, uh, and do so according to others whose needs are greater than mine. My wants and desires are less ethically relevant than my own needs and certainly less ethically relevant than the needs of others, especially when they conflict. It's also challenging to distinguish essential needs from those resulting from an individual's prior choices. If we go back far enough, it might be the case that an individual's need now for a liver transplant is the result of choices that they made as a young adult in consuming excessive amounts of alcohol and so uh, contributing to the development of cirrhosis of the liver. How far back do we go to find choices that an individual has made that results in their condition now um, and compare that with uh, needs that are not the result of choices at all that the individual has made. So this is a very difficult murky area and so trying to figure out how much an individual deserves one kind of treatment compared with another kind of treatment um, can be difficult to ascertain because of this murkiness. How about capacity? Well, if we try to figure out dessert in terms of capacity, then um, we want to make sure that we're uh, including both the latent and the actual ability to function in a specified way. The latent ability refers to um, potential capacity, capacity that might be developed with additional training or additional experience or knowledge or expertise, and actual ability to function, that is that they've um, developed the capacity and are now capable of functioning in a specified way. So when we're talking about capacities, we have to look at both. Most human beings have the capacity for language. Some are far more skilled at its use than others. Some human beings lack capacities, which most possess. For example, deaf individuals lack the capacity to hear, but not the capacity to communicate. So the general idea when we're using um, capacities, an individual's ability um, to determine their desert, uh, the general idea is that with a greater capacity, that individual deserves more resources um, and, uh, and then can be expected to make a greater contribution. And fairness and justice, remember, require everyone to have equal opportunity to develop their capacities and have the same expectations for exercising them. So that people have differential capabilities doesn't mean that they can't function uh, equivalently or contribute in uh, incomparable ways. So any deviation in equality of opportunity and expectations has to be justified, especially when what we're talking about are latent abilities. So any deviation in the opportunity to develop those capacities has to be justified. And it's also important to note that voluntarily assumed opportunities to develop those capacities justifies raised expectations of um, contribution in the future. So when opportunities are provided to individuals to develop their latent abilities or to refine their actual abilities, then uh, this can justify raised expectations of their future contribution on the basis of those now um, once latent now actual abilities and um, refined actual abilities. Now that we're talking about dessert, we have to talk about luck. Now, philosophers um, and ethicists have made uh, considerable strides in modifying our understanding of dessert by paying attention to the role of luck. Distributions of benefits and burdens on the basis of contributions, effort and entitlement and needs and capacities is complicated by the presence or absence of luck, or the presence of good luck, or the presence of bad luck. Moral luck is the kind of luck which has a moral effect, and that moral luck can be good or it can be bad. That is, 
that moral luck can make things worse for a person. It brings about worse uh, circumstances or worse effects or impedes their ability to act or that moral luck can have an enhancing, um, amplifying, multiplying effect on their actions. When differential treatment is at question, that is when we're considering treating someone unequally, we have to be careful to exclude the effects of luck and this is very important for professionals and public servants because many of the professions and many of the public services uh, have to do with individuals who are often uh, subject to luck at the whim of others. Luck is a catch-all way of conceptualizing factors which are beyond the good faith ability of individuals to control. The property owner who knows her levy is weak and it needs to be reinforced and is trying to do so but because her child got sick available funds are stretched thin and so she is not able to hire a civil engineer to facilitate the repair of the levy that runs along her property before the winter storms come and a flood results. Bad luck bad moral luck. So we want to be careful to um, avoid determinations of unequal treatment on the basis of luck. Accidents, illness, random events, circumstances of birth, that is who your parents are, what community or neighborhood you were born into, your culture, religious affiliation, all of those things that are circumstances of your birth about which you had no control these all and many others function to constrain individuals in their ability to contribute or to take advantage of opportunities or pursue the ends that are there, the goals that are there. Luck can undermine the most responsible among us and it's generally not the result of an individual's own doing though it can exacerbate poor planning, poor training, and lack of experience. Ultimately, luck would be an unjust or unfair basis upon which to determine um, differential treatment. All right, so wrapping up. Treating people justly and fairly requires treating individuals who are equal equally, treating ethically relevantly different individuals differentially, Differential treatment may be justified by different contributions, entitlements, needs, capacities, motivations, etc. The implications for the professional and the public servant are several here again. It's imperative to carefully distinguish what is under an individual's control from what is not. When we're determining differential treatment on the basis of desert, we have to award that differential treatment only for ethically relevant differences. We have to be consistent in our differential treatment. We have to also be impartial with regard to the differential treatment that we grant people. And we must be transparent. That is, professionals and public servants have to make available their reasoning that supports their judgment or their determination that unequal treatment is required or differential treatment is required. They have to be transparent regarding the criteria they use to justify the differential treatment. Is it on the basis of need? Is it on the basis of capacity? Is it on the basis of their contributions or their effort? They have to also be transparent regarding the differences in the treatment awarded. What you don't want as a professional is for your clients to find out that you've treated them differently and for them to be unsure of what your reasoning was and professionals also have to be transparent with regard to the expectations they have for individuals to contribute as a result of this differential treatment. Are your expectations higher, the same, or lower? Alright, here are some questions to think about. After you've gone through this lecture you should be able to address each of these. Some of them ask you to give an example um, from your own experience uh, and to analyze it. So once you're finished with these questions, then you should be ready for the next steps. Thank you very much.